Thanks. Here now. I'm here, yeah. How you doing? <laughs> you don't hear until we go on. That's the thing. You're on. Sweet. Happy June, everyone. That's right. We're back. <laughs> I heard you missed us. We're back. So how's everybody doing today? How are you doing today, Lou? I'm doing okay. Good, good. Good, good. Look at Lou. Quick beginning to the show. That's what we like. <laughs> Came flying in our brooms, and here we are. That's right. On time and That's ready right. to go. Guys are old pros already. That's how you can tell when people are comfortable, when they show up like 30 seconds before. Hey. They're supposed to go on. <laughs> Well, we are. We're we're comfortable. We're definitely comfortable. We we've been at this a long time, kind of. Not necessarily this radio show, but just you know this. things yes. we've things in general. This. We've been at this we've been at this a long time. So yes. How so was, yeah. Did you have a good month? Right. Someone's got their phone audio on. That's gonna oh, get no. muted. And also move them away from the mics if you get them close to the mics, because oh my goodness, we get a little crosstalk. Okay, we can't have that. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Which is run on Duncan. Yes, we do. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I'm excited for today because we have a guest coming on shortly, uh, really shortly, um, who uh, Leanne and I have known, my goodness, for a while. Have you, yeah, maybe. She's been a part of Festival of the Dead been for years. Been a part years. of Festival of the Dead. I'm trying to think of the first year. She'll know probably what year she started with Festival of the Dead. But, um, and she's a celebrated author. 65 books, I believe. I can't believe. I don't know. How do you have so the time? <laughs> I, yeah, I looked at her her uh, bibliography yesterday. And how, how do you do that? Right? I, yeah. Honestly. It's amazing. And, and she's so a wealth many, of knowledge. She so, is. She, she knows is. so many different things. And there are so many things that I want us to talk about that narrowing it down for this show is going to be actually quite difficult because she has so many things. Oh, wow. We're getting a hello from South Africa on the page. Hello. Hello from South Africa. You so, yes. Hello, South Africa. We're happy to happy to be uh, worldwide here. Yes. Worldwide. We're local. We're worldwide. You know, the whole thing. We're national. I have to say that so Christian yeah, laughs. Christian we're national. national. We're, we're everywhere. National. You're international. We're, we All are. We're international, but he's going to laugh when I say that we're national. So well, I see my uh, my handsome husband popped in to say hello in the background there. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so Yay to Rosemary. I love her books. I, as a medium, I have recommended her books. Yeah. I have read her books, and I've learned a lot. And most recently, I've enjoyed her books about angels yes. and our relationship with angels. She is, she knows so much, really? and she has researched, and she has traveled for this information. Mm. And I've got to say, it's been a pleasure to work with her um, at Festival of the Dead. I'm thrilled she's coming on this show. And she's going to be with us at Hexfest. Yes, Hexfest. She's going to be with us in August down in New Orleans. Yes, so. August tenth. If you haven't gotten your tickets, get your tickets That's now. Right. We're going to be teaching you all how to do the witches tea. tea. Yeah, the way that we do it. The way, the way we, that yep. we do the tea leaf readings. Um, and uh, and Leanne, you're going to um, you're going to teach about mediumship. Mediumship, and we're also going to work on dream interpretation. That's right. We're going to talk about dream interpretation down there, and um, and I'm going to do amulets and talismans. We're That's gonna phenomenal. Actually learn about them, but we're actually going to make one as well. So it's today I might find class. a better relationship with my angels. Is that because I need one? Uh, yeah, you could. <laughs> um, I would absolutely, you know, recommend. Um, you know, tapping Rosemary for some knowledge about that because she's a wealth of knowledge about that. So, yeah. um, I I feel particularly drawn to Saint Michael. I think a lot of people do. Um, I know you do as well. I do. Uh, Saint Michael also yep. is very strong in Stregoria, yeah. and we use him for protection. And you know, especially a shout out to all our soldiers out there mm -hmm. protecting us. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm particularly. I have. Um, I have some iconography of Saint Michael in the house. I do as well at my front door. And um, an artist friend of mine, Baraka Berger, has just done an incredible, incredible inspired painting of Saint Michael that I can't wait to get a print of. I I don't for one minute think that I could possibly afford the original, but she is going to get some prints done, and I'm super excited because it's a beautiful, beautiful rendition of of Saint Michael. I would love really to interested. see that. Yeah, I'm going to share her. Yeah. She shared it. She shared the the preview on on Facebook, and I'm going to share that with you because um oh what a beautiful, beautiful. I mean I love her work anyway, but 
what a fantastic um, interpretation. It, very inspired, I feel. So anyway, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about angels and, uh, and how they, how they, do they watch over us? And, you know, what, uh, what kinds of, um, you know, what kinds of relationships can humans have with angels and, and what uh, role do angels play in our lives? So we can talk about that. Tons of stuff. Even her paranormal work is yeah, off absolutely. the hook. I have done some house cleansing of recently, and I've used her book as a guide mm. to get out negativity or spirit that just shouldn't be there. You know, it's the question, is it a ghost or is it grandpa? Mm. Who's in the house? Who's in the house? <laughs> and I've, I've had some people um, speaking with me recently about young children who are experiencing paranormal activity in the house and speaking to their parents about it. So I'll, I'll be um, asking Rosemary a little bit about that as well. Well, young children, their antenna is up, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. and they're really, they're not jaded, you know. They are they are so open. They're just such an open channel because everything, they just absorb everything, you know. They're like little sponges, and they don't necessarily question, is this real? They To them, it's, right. it's almost like everything's real, yeah. you know, and so imaginary friends and you know stuffed animals that talk and all kinds of things are you know par for the course in a child's world so we start struggle with belief and children believe and when you have that open heart yeah and that open mind and spirit to welcome spirit in and well that's going to make you a magnet and that's why children tend to hear feel see yeah and connect with the dead. Well, we struggle with reality. We're, we're always denying what we're looking at. Always, it seems. Kids don't do that. Just, exactly. hey, look at that. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They, they have a little bit easier time um, accepting something without worrying about how it's going to make them look to other people. Right. We're so concerned that if we believe something, how is another person going to react to our belief in that? Um, and I just don't think kids have that layer yet, at least not really little kids. Unfortunately, I think, um, especially in the age of social media, children are under the microscope from a, a much broader um, cross-section of people than they ever have been before. Right. So unfortunately, um, you know, I think some of that is going away. Some of the innocence is, is being lost but really little children that are not on social media and you know and don't have access to those sorts of things i think that they have you know um le they have fewer boundary lines um we tend to adopt all kinds of boundary lines um when it comes to um what we think is supernatural versus what's you know accepted agreed upon reality with everyone so exactly the other night i don't know if i should be concerned or somewhat proud i stumbled upon my own daughter with a uh, bundle of sage running through the house because she heard a noise <laughs> uh, here i, I am you know all these years practicing the craft and i have my daughter running around with you know kosher salt and a bundle of sage <laughs> screaming get out get out get out I'm like what are you doing she goes i heard something <laughs> and I know it wasn't real. I'm like, it was me coming home. Stop it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So um, I want to talk about, uh, actually, if if we want to do the, the card, the tarot Absolutely. card. Absolutely. The tarot card for this month. I'd like to take a minute to which, wish all those Geminis out there a happy birthday, especially my boyfriend, who was <laughs> born on June 2nd. Here is... The lover's card, two versions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at them. Yep. Aren't they lovely? Okay. Mm, I love I love Robin Wood's art. I love Robin Wood's art as well. It's a very he's a very healthy looking man as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> lover's card is sixth in the trump is six trumped in the traditional tarot card deck. And the lover's card represents having two strong opinions. You know, usually it is associated with air for Gemini, and it is also associated with the planet Mercury. So you lo know those Geminis, uh, this is 
a card of communicating amongst each other. Uh, when I did some research on this, they'd like to call this Adam and Eve standing behind the tree of life. I want you to look at the nudity in this card. They have nothing to hide from mm. each other because in some ways they are the same person, much like a Gemini, but can I tell you, they are definitely different. <laughs> They're like identical twins, but with two different personalities. Um, so when you get this in a reading, you know, if you're asking a question, do they love me or do they like me? This is a great card that, you know, talks about love. Mm. But if you're asking about fidelity, sometimes that means, you know, there might be some temptation involved. You know, mm. there could be something not exactly clear. So I will generally look a little deeper because we don't want anyone messing around, do we? <laughs> This is two halves of the same whole. And what's nice about this card, it rules communication, information, and messages. So when people are asking me questions about mediumship and this card comes out, I say, yeah, they're around. Mm. This is the card of communication. Mm. This means that their love is still with you and it's still present. Generally, when you get this in a love reading, it is, it's, it's a good thing. So I don't want you to think that every time you see this, your boyfriend or your girlfriend's cheating on you. That is definitely not the case. Um, so expect good results when you see this in the upright fashion. Okay? Mm -hmm. Here's another image of it. Okay? This is a little deeper because it's that thought oh, deck. Thought deck, yeah. It's like how mm -hmm. you are in the world and mm -hmm. the universe. So sometimes when you're looking at this card, it comes out in different questions. So when this comes out in business, mm. I, I want to say you're starting a passionate project. This could be something you're learning or teaching, writing a book. This is a project that you're putting your whole heart into. Mm -hmm. And when you're asking a yes or no question, this is generally a yes. <laughs> This is the labor of love card, right? Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's one yes. of the labor of love cards. So if you're working for something you love, continue to do it and strive for it. So lovers in the positive sense, yes, you can predict that this is true love. You're going to have some good physical connection. Yes. Mm. Sex, baby. <laughs> All right. It's passion. It's, it's good choices. And it's the end of a troubling time. When it's inverted, this could mean infidelity. Mm. An attraction that's only physical. So, ladies, if you see this in the invert, it doesn't necessarily mean he's calling you back. That mm. could have been for fun. Mm. And that's okay. Bad choices, and it also means passions that are obsessions. And that is not true love. Mm. So, happy birthday, Gemini. Mm. I hope you enjoyed your love is card. <laughs> I want to have. I want to throw a couple comments out there as well. Because uh, just from the experiences that we've had, you yeah. know, reading for people over the years, you know, we get a lot of women in particular, although I'm sure, you know, um, there's a cross section of men that do get readings, but it is more popular actually for women to get them. Um, and a lot of women will say, you know, oh, you know, I'm seeing this, there's, I th I'm worried about this woman, you know, like there's a woman who is, you know, after my guy. You know, and whether they're married or they're just, mm -hmm. you know, committed to each other. And she's concerned because this woman's throwing herself at, you know, the guy and she's concerned that something's going to happen. And it's like sometimes they'll say, what can you do? Like, can I do something to, you know, to to stop this? You know, give me something like, a, can I do a spell or is there something I can do to make sure, you know, that he is not going to cheat on me with this girl? First of all. I got to say, you know, it's whenever you work magic, you are putting your energy, you have to pour your energy into it. So you really want to think about what you're spending that energy on. It's better to not try to control another person with magic. Control yourself. It's less expensive. <laughs> Ma you know, energy yeah. wise, it's less expensive. It's really the only person you do have control over in the situation really is yourself. Yep. So rather than trying to impact the other people in the equation, try to impact your contribution to the equation. Is there a reason that you think that he might be looking to stray? Is there a problem in the relationship? Fix that problem. 
then you don't worry that he's going to stray. Right. Because let's face it, there are many women out there who are just desperate for attention, who throw themselves at men, whether in the workplace or out there in the world, who, for whatever reason, you know, need the validation that they're attractive, they need to throw it out there constantly. Your guy is going to come into contact with these women all the time. Do you really want to put out the amount of energy that it takes to put a whammy on a person like that? Um, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Is it advisable? No. Yeah. I wouldn't advise it. And any guy that's going to put you in a position where you're constantly having to defend against this stuff, where you don't trust him, and that's the word, is trust. You need to be able to trust the person you're in that relationship with. If you can't trust that person, get out of that relationship. It's that simple. So sometimes you're not with the right lover. Right. Sometimes that's why your lover's card comes up inverted. Not only is your lover maybe looking for other options, but perhaps you should be too. Because if you're not getting treated like the queen you are, move on. Move on, ladies and gentlemen, Move because on. life is short, and it should be filled with love, passion, and things that make you confident. Good life lessons. Seriously. Absolutely. I said to someone, hey, why are, you, why are you trying to bind or curse this other woman? Mm. Why not do something for yourself? Absolutely. I told them to take their money and go get their nails done. Mm. That would be a lot more productive than <laughs> stabbing a voodoo doll. Yeah. Ooh. Go get a pedicure. Have yeah. someone rub your feet for an hour. Call I mean, a good friend and just whine. It's so much better and healthier. Mm. It's good for your brain. Yeah, absolutely. Preferably with wine. Right? Yes. Yeah. Hey, yeah. So I want, I want to talk a little bit about the gemstones. Um, and I'm going to bring up pearls. Do you ever wonder why pearls are so popular to wear for proms and weddings? They're, they are a popular choice. I don't know. For years, I always thought pearls meant tears. Well, um, they symbolize purity, honesty, and integrity. Nice. So when you're, you know, when you're a, uh, going to a prom, of course, it's sort of like, oh, I'm a, yeah. I'm a young, pure thing. I'm the maiden. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but And then when you're getting married, it's like, I want the blessings of the purity of the relationship, honesty in the relationship, integrity in the relationship, and stuff like that. That's um, beautiful. The couple that I married gave me pearls as pearls. a gift. It's very common for weddings and also My for My daughter's pearls. birthstone. Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, and I bought her mother, for mother, her first Mother's Day, I bought her a pearl beautiful necklace and then she gave it to her so now she owns it now they have always been equated with the essence of femininity as well as happiness prosperity and of course beauty so and i think they're a nice stone for cancerians right yes they ocean, are very nice it's it that was. ocean connection it's the ocean connection yeah, i do nice. and i love my pearls absolutely so um another stone this is a gemini birthstone agate and i, I think i mean there are so many different kinds of agate Agate and Chalcedony both are considered to be, um, you know, for June and, and for Gemini. And um, there are so many different colors that if you don't like one color, like I, I can remember my mom saying she didn't like her birthstone because she didn't like topaz. She didn't like the brown topaz. And I said, there's other colors of topaz. There's you know? so many. So if you don't like one kind of agate, choose another one. But specifically, um, traditionally, blue lace agate and Botswana agate have been very common for Gemini. And I love blue lace agate. So pretty. That in jewelry is so pretty. Um, Gemini people are known to be articulate. And uh, these are stones about communication. So like, just like you were talking about the lover's card yeah. that's associated with Gemini, these stones are also associated with that eloquence and that. You know, the Once ability you get that they a Gemini to talk and you can't get them stopping. <laughs> <laughs> but um, specifically with blue lace agate can have a calming effect on the sometimes erratic Gemini. So um, you can wear that to have, you know, calm things down. It aids in focus and concentration, which can be a challenge for some Gemini people. Um, Chalcedony. It's nicknamed the Speaker's Stone. It reminds you to think before you speak um, and give you time to reflect and meditate on your words to avoid saying something that you may regret. It can curb the impulse to say things in anger. And for those people that suffer from stage fright, it can help banish that. 
so wear it when you're public speaking. I particularly love aqua chalcedony or blue chalcedony. You know, I love, and purple. I love purple chalcedony. It comes in so many different colors. And the other stone that I want to talk about this month is moonstone. And that's, for me, I think Cancerian yes. moonstone. Because um, you guys are, you know, you're, we're heading into your time. Um, moonstone connects us to the power of the moon and therefore the goddess. Uh, psychic ability, intuition, and prophecy, and of course, wisdom. Um, the lore, it is believed, believe it or not, to cure sleeplessness, and I think that's because it can help you align with your natural cycles, okay. just like the cycles of the moon, the cycles of the tides, the cycles. I think the reason Moonstone was believed to help you get back into your normal sleep cycle. If your okay, sleep to cycle help you is, relax. I, yeah. If your sleep cycle is disturbed, it can help you get your sleep cycle back. That might be a good back. thing for me to um, wear when I sleep at night. There you go. And it was also believed to reconcile estranged lovers. Oh. So speaking more about that, you know. Yeah, back into the that lovers. We were <laughs> back into the lovers. I believe that Rosemary is also a Cancerian. I think her is birthday she? is July 8th. I'm not sure. Is she on the line? Yes, she Excellent. Say hi, Rosemary. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Rosemary. Good morning. How are you? Uh, you are quite right. I am a Cancer, and it is July 8th. And I am July 9th. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Perfect, perfect. I'm, I'm so excited about your new show and to be, uh, you know, on the debut. It's just fantastic. Yeah, we, we actually, we launched it um, last month, but we did not have a guest. You are our first guest. So we, we kind of launched it last month to just basically give people an idea of what it was going to be like. And then you were our first guest. So we're thrilled to have you. I am so happy to talk to you, Rosemary. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get through as many of them as we can. Excellent, excellent. So um, we were speaking earlier about angels, and I think that's where we're going to lead off because um, we, Leanne and I both have uh, sort of connections to angels, and she has read a couple of your books on angels. Yes, there. I did, and I was always, as I was reading them, I was wondering, when did you develop your connection with angels? It started when I was a kid, and, uh, you know, children are very open psychically. They have imaginary playmates, so to speak, which aren't really imaginary. Uh, they have uh, psychic experiences, and uh, I felt uh, the presence of angels around me um, when I was very young, and I was familiar with angels. Um, I was brought up as a Methodist, and of course we learned about angels in Sunday school and, and from Bible studies, and uh, so it just seemed natural to me that uh, I would be aware of angels, and um, in particularly when I went to bed at night, uh, I heard angelic music. It was like angels were in my room kind of singing, singing me to sleep, and it wasn't until I got older that um, it became aware to me that not everybody experiences this. And in fact, um, the psychic experience uh, in general is a very unleveled playing field. Um, and um, that kind of puzzled me and propelled a lot of my interest in studying these areas further. But that connection with the angel realm continued throughout my whole life. Uh, and as I got older, I did research and reading. Um, I uh, brought them into my meditative experiences. Uh, I consider them my uh, terrific spiritual allies. And uh, I, I keep um, images around them in the house. And I wear angel medals also a lot, uh, the signs and the seals of uh, some of the major archangels. So um, it's a presence that has been with me throughout, and um, I think that the, the more we cultivate that, that awareness and that relationship, the better we are able to benefit from that intermediary connection to the source of all being, to the divine. How can our listeners connect with angels a lot more deeply in their own lives? 
the best way is in meditation and to first ask for connection to your guardian angel. I believe that we all have at least one guardian angel, an angel that is with us from birth through life and maybe even lifetime to lifetime. And that other angels are present in our life and some uh, come and go as we go through different life experiences and we need to call upon different uh, attributes and qualities uh, to, to deal with those circumstances. And uh, I've been a big advocate of meditation. I've meditated uh, for most of my life. A few minutes a day can do wonders. You know, you don't need to sit down and try and be a yogi and spend hours at it to get results. You can do it in just a few minutes of being quiet and stilling the mind and asking for that connection. And so uh, if you ask to be connected to the angel realm for angels, that are significant to you in your life to make their presence known and uh, then you are in a receptive mode, you're likely to get some sort of impressions. You may feel a presence around you. You may have um, thoughts that pop into your head. I think it's important to get a name and a name may be a descriptor. For example, one of the most significant angel presences uh, that I had um, in, my, in my life was a being that I only identified as Silver Lady. Um, and that, that was based on her appearance. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be a biblical name. Uh, it can be whatever comes to you. And if you ask to be connected to that energy and, and for the angels to, uh, to help you out uh, and to be present for you um, as you, you go through just daily life situations, um, you will find uh, that presence becoming stronger and stronger. And initially, it may be very subtle. Uh, signs, uh, angels are very big on giving signs, like dropping a coin or a feather or something else that's significant to us. Uh, maybe very subtle, maybe urgings toward uh, taking some sort of action. Angels are not going to direct our lives. They're not going to pull our chestnuts out of the fire, but they're going to help us if we ask for them. They're, they're going to help us see the best possible way to navigate life. And that's the best way to get started. Yeah, Lou was wondering how he could uh, connect. I need a better relationship with my angels. I do. How do I foster that? What can I do to be in touch with them more? Well, I, I find, uh, I'm going to answer that from my own personal experience and what's really worked for me. I, I found that uh, certainly studying angels, and I've done um, several books on angels, including an encyclopedia. The more I read about them, the more I uh, studied them uh, and read about them, uh, that also fostered a deeper connection because uh, whatever we study, whatever we focus on, that's where the spiritual energy goes and angels are at a very high level of spiritual vibration so by reading about them thinking about them we're putting ourselves on a higher spiritual level that makes them more accessible to us i also like um keeping angel energy in uh, my home i was going to say uh, i have a little shrine and it's not doesn't yeah. have to be super elaborate but i do have a little shrine to saint michael and um, I feel like spending a couple of moments at that each day, you know, and even if you can't, quote unquote, meditate at it, um, even just paying it a little attention in some fashion, uh, maybe yeah. coming up with a little something that you say, um, you know, each day asking for um, him to watch over you or what. I feel like that just that right there would probably do it. It, it does, and I have an altar, too, and uh, especially, you know, for busy people, uh, we don't always have time in the morning or time in the evening that we feel we can devote to uh, a period of meditation, but pausing for a, a minute or two at an altar and uh, connecting energetically with whatever is on your altar uh, can be very significant. It's an energy that can carry you through the day, and so I do have... Uh, representations of angels uh, and uh, other, I would say, symbols of divinity that are important to me in my altar. Uh, very important connection. I like angel statuary, uh, mm, yeah. and I have paintings and icons of angels. I prefer more traditional renditions, and that's my personal preference. Uh, 
there's a lot in our, our modern pop culture that's kind of cutesified angels. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that's an energy that really works for them. I, I like the big power traditional representations myself. I like and then the um, a number of years ago, uh, I started wearing angel medals. And actually, it was Christian Day who uh, was, was the instrument to introduce me to the angel medals. Uh, which, of course, I was familiar with from reading magical texts. But uh, uh, at his shops in Salem, uh, especially Hex, uh, some uh, very nice silver medallions with the angel seals on them of uh, important archangels. Mm. And I started with Uriel. Uh, I was, when I picked up the medal for Uriel, I felt a zingy energy to it. Mm. And uh, I felt, well, this is what I need to connect with first. And um, very little is known about Uriel because Uriel didn't make it into our angel lexicon very deeply. You have to go into some of the apocryphal texts to, to learn about this angel. But um, Uriel holds the solar fire of truth. And uh, the solar fire is a very purifying energy. And especially since so much of my work in the paranormal over the years has dealt with negative entities, you know, negative hauntings, spirit attachments, and things like that, I felt this was a very powerful energy to start bringing into my consciousness. And by wearing the metal, uh, it, it became a bridge to that spiritual frequency. And I believe that this is what amulets and metals and talismans do for us. Mm -hmm. The objects themselves do become energized with our intention and our yes. prayer energy and our consciousness. But mo most important of all, they're connectors. They're connectors to a very high level of spiritual force. So I started with Uriel, and then I added um, the major archangels that we're most familiar with, Michael, of course, because he's a significant factor in protection and guardianship and um, your inner strength, you know, the warrior in you. Yes. Uh, and Gabriel, of course, for uh, the spiritual light of, of um, beginnings and uh, new birth and bringing something new into consciousness and Raphael for the healing energy. Uh, so uh, I have all of those medals, and um, I, I like to keep at least one of them on my person. Uh, sometimes I have all of them. Uh, Uriel is probably still the most important one to me, and I will often wear that when I'm doing lecturing workshops uh, because I want to connect to that solar fire energy and uh, also when I'm doing investigative work. Now, do you do you um, call upon the angels when you're doing your paranormal um, explorations? When you when you're going to a place that has, you know, uh, that's purported to have spirit activity that's maybe not necessarily all on the positive, would you would you kind of call upon that energy during during those investigations? Yes, I have many times because I consider angels to be our frontline defenses. And uh, I, I believe that the regular practice of meditation keeps that connection going. And uh, I, I think what I've seen in the paranormal field uh, is um, a, a tendency to think that, well, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You know, you don't have to meditate, prepare yourself spiritually. All you have to do is offer a prayer to St. Michael before you start an investigation, and bingo, you're going to be automatically protected. And while I think it's useful to, to do those kinds of prayers, it's much more effective if you have uh, a regular fertilization of your consciousness through frequent or daily um, connection. So, yes, many times when I've gone into what I know is going to be a problem situation or area, I will prepare in advance for that, not just when I get to the site, but prepare in advance for that to, um, to pump up my aura, to uh, invoke uh, angelic assistance and, uh, you know, added layers of protection. Uh, for the good of all. It's not just for me, but it's for the people I'm dealing with, the people I'm working with, 
for the environmental situation I'm in. Uh, I want to be as well prepared as possible to have uh, a positive impact. What do you do after you investigate uh, an unpleasant area? Do you, is there a meditation? Is there something you do to protect yourself afterwards? Because I have done some investigations in house cleansing, and then afterwards I'm just, I'm beat. I, I, I feel like my life force is just sucked right out of me. It's very easy to feel your life force vampirized, and that's exactly what negative entities seek to do. They're very good at psychic vampirism. Uh, and I, so I have a number of things that I do, and it depends upon the intensity of what I have been exposed to in the, in the course of uh, working in an environment. And by the way, if I could give myself just a little plug. Please do, um, absolutely. I have a brand new, brand new book out called Guide to Psychic Protection, where I talk about a lot of these things. It's a very good basic guide uh, for people to uh, protect themselves against psychic attack and psychic vampirism, and then also uh, ways to just bolster their natural defenses so that they have um, a more of a deflection property going. But the one thing that I always do, regardless of whether or not I've been in a benign or neutral uh, or negative situation, uh, is I pull down my shutters. And uh, anyone in paranormal investigation, even if they say they're you know, psychic is a stone. Uh, you're going to be using your psychic faculties in this kind of work. And so your chakra centers are going to be a lot more open than they are normally. Mm. And so it's important to shut that energy down so that uh, things that want to trail after you um, lose their ability to do so. And so one visualization I have is that all of my chakras are connected on a string like the uh, pull you have on Venetian blinds, and I pull those shutters down, and I visualize that string going all the way down um, my primary chakra system from the crown to the root. Uh, and um, then another shutting down that I consider to be very important is um, I pull the shutters down mentally because there are entities that are capable of latching onto thought energy. and. It's not unusual for, for, uh, for example, investigators to go home from a situation kind of wound up by it and maybe even a little afraid of what they might have encountered or worry that, oh, is something going to follow me home? Um, and so I like to sever the thought as much as possible. I'm going to go back and think about it at some point because I write about these things, I lecture on these things, so I do give it attention later. But after I've had some energetic distance from the actual investigation or cleansing uh, or, you know, being on site somewhere. And so for that, um, I visualize literally concrete walls coming down. Uh, I visualize four of them, concrete walls coming down around my head, like you know, shielding my mental thought from mm -hmm. negative outside influence. And I take some time uh, to wind down. Uh, I get my thoughts completely off the investigation, reading, watching something, uh, distracting on television. Um, very good for putting energetic distance between me and what I've just gone through. And then, of course, there are situations where you want to take that salt scrub shower or the salt bath, uh, which is very effective for getting the clingy energy off you. Sometimes you have to do that with friends and people in our lives, <laughs> yes. too. Yeah, I was they, thinking they, the sometimes same thing. you do that with the living. <laughs> exactly. Never mind the dead. Um, I would like to know what is the one of the most, can you tell us one of the most intense experiences you've had where your shields were challenged? Yes, there are entities that seem to be able to get around you uh, no matter what you've got in place. And um, I had uh, a case, some of these cases that I've worked on, I've followed for prolonged periods of time. And I had a case that I was on for uh, several years uh, because nothing that was employed worked. It was a rural property. 
uh, in Pennsylvania, and it had um, multiple manifestations of things going on, it had residual energy, mysterious creatures. There, there was uh, a, uh, a dark entity that literally occupied the land that uh, was creating the most problems. And it was very hostile to people. Um, and it had communicated to us that um, the people who had come onto this rural property after a period of dormancy and reactivated it uh, for agricultural purposes, which they were not welcome, they didn't like them, didn't like their machinery, they'd been there long before people, uh, we were squatters on its territory and it was going to make us miserable until we all got out. Uh, which it eventually succeeded in doing. That's wow. Uh, but there That's was one serious. particular <laughs> time where uh, I and uh, another mediumistic woman who had had experience with this entity and uh, some of the investigators that I've been working with, we, uh, we held a, a seance and we took extra precautions to um, cleanse the environment as much as possible to protect ourselves and none of us were aware of anything happening during the seance except this hostile communication. Um, but afterwards, we felt like something had put a straw in us and sucked us all dry. Yeah, that's, that's I, I felt like a bale of oh, hay. That's not good. Uh, like I had cotton in my head and my body was a bale of hay. And it took about a day to recover from that. Yeah. Uh, it had just gotten around all of us. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. How do people know the difference? And I, I, that experience is terrifying. I'm not, I don't like spooky things. Um, <laughs> I'd run out of the house really? screaming with my sage, holy water, peppers and garlic all around me. How can we tell the difference um, when spirit comes to us? Is it haunting or is it grandpa? Uh, you mean, how do you discern? Yeah, how can, you know, a lot of people uh, will contact me and they're trying to banish an element out of their home that is family, that is just a natural spirit that's there to protect them. They can't tell, so they're all afraid about this loving energy. I don't know how to give them advice to just relax. Right. Because when it's scary, I know it's scary. Because then I run out. Ask Deb. <laughs> well, uh, for me, it's been something that uh, the discernment is, is an ongoing process of learning. And mm -hmm. uh, the negative end, end of things, uh, there's so much uh, masquerading that goes on um, that sometimes it takes a while to figure out exactly what you're dealing with. And also, there are a variety of negative entities that sort of have the same bag of tricks. All right, Rosemary, can you adjust your phone a little bit? We kind of lost you a little bit. How's that? Oh, that's yeah, much better. better. Yeah, you're back. Okay. Um, there are different negative entities. I was saying they have the same bag of tricks, and sometimes it takes a while to figure out uh, what the lay of the land is. Um, but it, it takes practice, and so people who are not accustomed to psychic or uh, mediumistic work, uh, they are confused. They don't know what they're dealing with, and they're automatically frightened of almost anything, even if it's not trying to frighten them. Uh, and so, of course, the more you work in this field and develop your, your psychic abilities, then you start to tune into those more subtle um, vibrations and frequencies that that helps the picture pop. Uh, it's always useful to ask for bona fides uh, and, uh, you know, challenging unknown uh, presences as to who they are and what are your bona fides, uh, you know, show us, uh, demonstrate to us that you are what you say you are. And then that, is, that has response has to be evaluated as well. So um, it's not uncommon for things to take a while to shake out in some cases in terms of what you're actually dealing with. Good to know. Thank you. 
I know people who have actually said, you know, here's a, a key word or here's a key image that I will give so that you'll know that it's me after I pass. I think we all kind of have to come up with that and tell our loved ones, you know. Yes, I already have. Yeah, here's yeah. something that It'll I... It'll be me. Yep. And here's the thing. You, you, you might want to come up with a couple of them because you're not exactly sure what you're going to be able to communicate from the other world. We take communication, very straightforward communication for granted here. And I, I find, and I think, Rosemary, you'll probably agree with me, spirit communication is, is uh, you know, muddy at best. I mean, it's not, it's certainly not, we don't process it the same way here on this plane that it comes out there. So it's sort of, I mean, I suppose some spirits are more adept than others, and I think maybe the longer that they've been over there, the more adept they get. But I, I find that, especially with new spirits, how, how are you going to know that they're going to be able to either produce the correct image or, you know, say the thing? That's why we wait a year. I tend to tell everyone, wait a full year before you reach out to a medium. Let grief pass so you can have clear communication between you, your spirit, and your medium. Mm. Hmm. Do you find that, yeah, Rosemary? Uh, afterlife communication and spirit communication are two major areas for me, and I've done a lot of experimental work myself, and uh, I know a lot of people in the field who have um, done that, uh, what's called instrumental transcommunication from the technology end of it. And I've also studied the mediumistic end of it. And uh, we have no universal formulas. You know, the, the waiting a year uh, is often a good idea because I've heard many cases where um, the newly dead uh, need adjustment. Uh, and they, they may not even know how to get through. On the other hand, uh, we do have communications from people who pass, uh, like within a few days of their death or a few weeks, where they are able to get a sign or a message or a dream visitation through. So it, it falls on both ends of the spectrum. And uh, when, when the signal or visitation comes uh, while grief is still very fresh, it can go a long way to alleviating grief. But uh, for more reliable communications and maybe even longer communications, I, I think it's, it's better to wait a while. It is, here again, it's very uneven. And uh, what I've seen uh, from what the dead have communicated themselves about it, they say that there is a bridge that has to be built. It's an energetic bridge, and without it, the connection cannot be made, and it depends on the other side, and it depends on the living. It depends on our individual consciousness, which mm. is a real wild card. That's... And some people who desperately want some sort of sign from a deceased loved one, they don't get it, and they, they think they're being punished or that something bad has happened to the soul who's passed on, and that's not the case. Um, the technology has been very uneven. What works for one researcher doesn't work for another. Um, some, uh, some of the dead are able to come through frequently and with, with uh, you know, extended communications. Others make one or two appearances and boom, they seem to be gone. Well, these things uh, are as, this is as, as uh, varied and, and um, you know, and different as life. I mean, that's, that's life right there. You know, not everybody communicates the same way. Not everyone's as verbal, you know. Not, not everyone, you know, uh, shares the same language. Not everyone shares the same body language. Not, you know, it's, it's sort of like we're, we're relying on, it's the same way communication works here. We're, we're relying on picking up cues that maybe not everybody picks up, where some people are better at, writing things out some people are better at speaking some people are better you use automatic writing a lot yes, don't do. you leanne in your mediumship I work i absolutely do use automatic writing i love it do you use it rosemary uh, i have on, on and off and i went through a period where uh, i did it daily and i found it to be absolutely amazing it's one of the easiest and best tools yeah. to use 
And uh, by the way, another small plug, uh, I'm just putting the finishing touches on a book called Contacting the Dead, which will be out Ooh, in a few that's weeks. That's going to be fantastic. Uh, I will refer. It involves technology, mediumship. This is great. Um, dream visitations. Uh, and includes a lot of valuable information for how people have made their connections with mm. some tips and techniques for others as well. I That's love good. it. It's good. Opening up the hearts and minds to people. Let's it's explain, job. Um, Leanne, explain, if you will, how someone can try automatic writing. How can our listeners try automatic if writing? You, you can try automatic writing right now at your own discretion. I usually begin with a pretty heavy meditation where I visualize myself on a journey. Okay. And wherever that journey is, it's to a peaceful place in which I call the land of the dead. Your land of the dead may not be the same as mine, so I visualize myself getting there. And once my so you're I going am, to Florida. So <laughs> if that's where you no, want to go, those people aren't dead yet. Okay. No, it's not Florida. That's not where I go. I go somewhere. Trust me. <laughs> and I visualize myself there, and I relax. And this is the hardest thing: is just to allow yourself the opportunity to move the pen. People are so want to control the process. They want to write or they want to say, oh my goodness, I'm imagining this. The key to automatic writing is letting go, mm. is letting go and allowing the scribbles to turn into letters and to look at your first example. And can I tell you, it's just going to be a bunch of scribbles. But look at that. It's like looking at a cloud and seeing shapes. It's kind of like tea leaf reading. Yep. You're going to see letters start to form. And as you do this again and again, and I recommend do this on a full moon when you're much more heightened to do so. Get your moonstone out and the crystals that Sandra recommended today <laughs> and lay them about. You might want to burn some mugwort to get you a lot more elevated. But tonight, just let's do it tonight. It's a great night to do it. Yeah. Grab a pen and a paper, burn some incense, and relax. And call to yourself your beloved dead and allow them to write you notes. It may just be a letter. And can I tell you, a lot of people want to say, oh, that just happened by chance. Oh, oh I did. that's not really there. Believe in the impossible for one second. Mm. You've had some pretty intense... Um, you do this at the seances, yes? Yes, I do the seances on every Friday night at Omen, and I've had some pretty intense experiences. Where people who have never even done this before came out with amazing things. Amazing names, uh, dates, uh, places. Somebody actually just drew a picture with their eyes closed. All we had to do was turn it around, and you could actually see a picture of a cat form. Um, there are so many different ways to connect with the dead that's incredible that somebody drew it but they didn't draw they didn't it. see it it was upside down yeah and all we had to do was turn it around i so think it's I'll almost say like it. spirits sitting across from them drew it yes and if they turned it the opposite way they saw it they that's saw amazing. it and you know what i'll do i think for my next seance i'll ask my guests if they wouldn't mind me keeping their automatic writing and we'll i'll show you what some of those examples look like that would be great i would love to see that if they're if they're willing to yes, part with them yes because some of if them they're willing take to them part home. with them <laughs> maybe take a photograph and then print the photo there you go yeah you can take photos on your phone and then print the photos and then we, they can keep it but we can also see it as an example if they would yes. like to that would be wonderful you, so you Rose, might want to uh, collect those into like um, a book even if it's photographed that's automatic a writing. great idea Have that available. people can leave through it and you know, see the kinds of things that uh, others have been able to uh, manifest. Definitely, like a little scrapbook so that when people go to the seances, they can see what other, other that, people... That's a great idea. I'm going to advises start doing the woman, that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Advises the woman. Rosemary, you've written 63 books. Do I have the number right? Uh, well, I'm closing in on 70 now. Oh, I'm, I'm over 65, <laughs> and I'm closing in on 70. Amazing. I also have a publishing company. I've had it for quite a while, but in the uh, past two or three years, I've been um, expanding it quite a bit. So I publish um, all my own works now as well as the works of other people. And that's called Visionary Living Publishing. Um, I know we're coming up on the end of the show. I'll yeah. just give a couple of websites. VisionaryLivingPublishing.com is my uh, publishing site. And uh, VisionaryLiving.com is my personal site. So um, I've always got 
new projects in, in the works. Uh, I've got another book on mysteries of the afterlife coming out right after Contact with the Dead, which is going into near-death experiences and uh, death, dying, and survival uh, research and uh, experiences. And a, a, a lot of this involves personal testimony, and that's really the most powerful of all for people is to uh, connect with other people's experiences that are similar to your own. It's very validating. Well, Rosemary, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, Leanne and I and Lou uh, have just enjoyed this time talking with you so much. I can't wait to see you at HexFest. Can't wait to see you at HexFest. <laughs> you shall have oh, a hurricane. We are going to have a wonderful yeah. time. And I want to tell everyone that um, next month, our guest, I'm going to hold up. This I found this old copy of New Witch Magazine from when uh, Christopher was on the cover. We have Christopher Penzak, who will be with us here next month um, on Thursday the 12th of July. He is an international author and healing facilitator, trained in the traditions of magic, shamanism, and holistic health. His practice draws upon the foundation of modern witchcraft, blended with the wisdom of mystical traditions from across the globe. The co-founder of the Temple of Witchcraft and the co-owner of Copper Cauldron Publishing and the author of many, many books. So we will be excited to speak with Christopher next month. Rosemary, thanks again. Everyone out there, thanks for Bye. being on the chat, and we'll see you in a month. Yeah.